you're doing. Yeah. Well, uh, keep in mind, of course, the email from yesterday, right? President Feller's not playing around. Um, hmm. What? What? Yeah, so. Well, the, the, the beds and the quads should be. Well, no, but like six feet is. Right, the bed should not be six. They should be more, significantly more than six feet apart, or the head parts. You can. Um, you, yeah, you can discuss that with Dean Welsh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I haven't heard anything about it. Well, yes, but things like that tend to be handled relatively quietly. Like, if there's any one thing I've learned about dealing with stuff at Wabash is that things tend to happen. You have to trust that things are happening on the DL in the background, and they usually are. So, yeah. Even if you don't know about it, right? Because it's not as if we're going to have public floggings or put stockades up on the mall. That actually might be a good solution, right? You know, you, uh, you were within six feet of a pier, right, for 15 minutes. Uh, to the stockades with you, and then all the other students can stand six feet away and throw rotten vegetables at you, and, right, um, I mean, if it worked in 1200, then, AD, then it'll work in, you know, <laughs> 2020 AD, so, anyway, all right, good morning, Jack and Noah, Noah, are we, uh, are we back in Fishers, getting the car, or are we, we on campus and just couldn't drag ourselves over to over to class. Looks like we're missing Mr. Vasquez. Who else are we missing? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We're missing two other people besides Noah. Some, yeah, Ricky and Mr. Vasquez. Man. Oh, you just couldn't drag yourself out of bed today, Noah? All right. Well, the stick beating awaits when you do finally make it back. And Jack, uh, I guess you're going to get many stick beatings when you finally make it back to campus. So anyway, uh, all right. So let's pick up kind of where we left off last time, which was um, we were talking um, decodings. So uh, I'll put a link to this on uh, Canvas. Uh, this, well, actually, let me just extract this zip file because it's got a bunch of um bunch of other stuff in it besides um yeah uh okay so let's see and i want to go into list mode so the uh this file has a whole bunch of stuff in it um but in particular the thing i want to look at is this excel spreadsheet and so we'll just open that up in libra office um which is basically an open uh open office uh kind of thing and i installed that on all of y'all's pies um beforehand those of you who got your own um instead of well you should have used my image even if you got your own hardware so it should be there um anyway so this thing is a gigantic spreadsheet and um you know we don't have to really worry right this instant about reading every line of it um, but, uh, what I just wanted to kind of show you was, um, in Brookshire, right, we have 12 operations and they, uh, each have their own op code that is a four bit sequence. Uh, you know, we could have a theoretical maximum of 16 op codes, but we only actually use 12 of them. And, um, then, uh, 
they have op codes and then they have um, uh, operands. Okay, so you know if it's loading data from uh, memory to a register, you need to specify which register and which memory address you're coming out of, right? So all of the different operations have their own operands based on whatever they're doing, and some of them have sort of stupid operands. So for example, the halt command, um, its operands are basically just all zeros. Um, and uh, the the reason that the, the guy who designed that particular architecture did that was so that regardless of the type of instruction you were executing, if it didn't need uh, 12 bits worth of operand, you still use 12 bits, and by doing so, every instruction is exactly 16 bits wide, uh, which is convenient, right? Because then the program counter increments by the same amount every time. You don't have to vary it. Not all architectures do that. So the, uh, the Nintendo, um, the 6502, has variable length instructions, uh, which simplifies some things but complicates others. So, um, you know, it's sort of a... There's no perfect way to do it. There's always going to be a trade-off. Uh, okay, so I just want to, you know, kind of look through this, and let's just sort of see what we've got um, here um, for for reference sake. Okay, so the uh, the what you're looking at. Uh, let's just pick a um, an operation that we already have have used. Okay, so we like like load or store. Um, okay, here we go. All right, so we've used, for example, load R, load register, with um, with uh, various things, and there are actually sort of a couple flavors of it, uh, depending on uh, you know what kind of loading you're doing, but uh, in particular, if we look over at, um, so let's say just take the second one here, um, right, the stuff at the far right, or sorry, the most significant bit end, okay, is going to be your, your opcode kind of thing. Uh, and then this immediate 19 and RT, um, uh, let's see, look at what we've got there. How many bits does RT have allocated to it? It has five bits. Okay. How many things can you address with five bits? So how many different patterns can be encoded with five bits? Yes. Two to the fifth, which is... 32, okay? And that makes sense. How many registers do we have on this machine? Or on an ARM architecture? You guys remember? It's basically 32, right? There's a couple of those 32 that have specialized purposes, but there basically are 32 of them. Uh, okay, so that makes sense. So if we're going to have a 32-bit wide instruction, Five bits in this case have to be allocated to uh, to say which register we're dealing with, or for some of the other uh, ones. Like for example, we'll look at the addition uh, one in a minute. Well, there we have to specify three registers: the two source registers and the destination register. Okay, the immediate nineteen is um, basically. Uh, the 19 refers to how many bits you get to use, okay? So if I wanted to load register zero with a specific number of my choosing, I can only put in a specific number of my choosing that's up to 19 bits in size, even though how big are the registers? How wide are the general registers on this machine? It's partly a trick question because there's two answers, but an arm. How wide are the registers? Yeah, they're either 64-bit or we could just use the 32-bit sort of front part of it, right, for, for stuff. 
but point being, they're, they're basically 64 bits wide. Well, they're 64 bits wide, and they can do 64-bit arithmetic, but the load immediates, load register with a, a particular number, can only actually do 19-bit numbers. Okay, so, you know, let's say that you wanted to load in some really, 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 really big number, right? We've got a bit of a problem here um, that you can't load in every single number that you might want. Um, uh, just magically, right? Because to do so, like, let's say you wanted to load a 64-bit number. Well, you would need at least 64 bits to specify the number plus the instructions to do it, right? That far exceeds the 32-bit width of the instructions. Okay, so that's sort of a problem, and we'll, we'll kind of see how the um, solution you know, what, what the solution is for that sort of stuff later. Um, and then um, over on the right here, it's giving uh, some of these things obviously are, uh, have, uh, you know, unknown lookups because Excel doesn't know what immediate 19 or RT are, right? Those are just variables. But in particular, we can also see sort of what's the structure of this going to be in hex. Um, and then how many bits does it take for the opcode in this particular case for this particular kind of operation? Yeah, it's a little hard to see, but it's eight bits. Okay. Uh, and that makes sense, right? 19 plus five is 24. So that leaves us with eight left over to get up to 32. Um, okay. So you'll notice that even though all instructions are the same width on the ARM architecture, right, everything is a 32-bit instruction. Within those 32 bits, not everything is allocated the same way, right? So some instructions need more bits for the opcode and fewer bits for operands, and others you get, you need fewer bits for opcodes and more bits for operands, okay? That's different than the Brookshire architecture, right? So in the Brookshire architecture, how many bits determine the opcode? It's four, every single time, four bits, no exceptions, okay? Uh, and that makes it a lot easier to decode these things because you can look at just those front four bits and be like, oh, it's an addition or a load or whatever, right? Here, excuse me, you would have to know what the bit patterns are for the shorter instructions or the longer ones, okay, and be able to decide accordingly then how to decode it. So the circuitry that would be required uh, in the process of for decoding the instructions and then, you know, the, the control logic would be accordingly more complicated because we have sort of that, that variable length of opcode, okay? Is that okay? Yeah. Uh, okay. So we've got that. And um, then uh, you'll notice some of the other ones here. So like uh, um, the load and store pairs, uh, just for example. Uh, and we'll, we'll obviously talk about a lot of these different, um, different um, things. Uh, you'll notice that they are they have multiple registers that they need to be interfacing with, okay? And uh, each register that needs to be involved takes five bits to encode, right? So some of them you only get an immediate of seven or 19 or whatever, okay? It just depends on the operation, okay? Um, so let's let's go find uh, the addition one because we did use that also last time. Uh, okay, so let's just. I mean, I guess I could just scroll here. Here we go. There's add. Okay, so there's a couple of um, couple of things, right? So we had add immediate. Okay, so this is data processing immediate. That's not what we want to look at for right this instant, because what kind of addition did we do uh, in our, our cheesy sample program?
we were just adding um, two numbers. Uh, yeah, we were just adding two numbers um, for um, uh, like two numbers that were loaded out of memory, right? So one registers value to another registers value. We weren't adding specific numbers as just whatever came out of the memory or I mean the uh, whatever we loaded into the registers. Okay, well, uh, we've got, for example, here, right? Um, the opcode. Okay. Okay, so we got some operation stuff. There's a shift thing. We'll talk about what that does later. Okay, and then if I'm going to add two registers and store their answer someplace, then I need to specify all of those things, right? And in this particular architecture, the order that the, it puts things are, are what numbers are we going to add together? We're going to add two registers, let's say REM and RN, whichever two those are, okay? And those two five-bit patterns go in the spots that they do. And then, um, then where do we put the answer? RD. Okay, now notice that the order is in some sense backwards from the way that we would write this in actual assembly, right? Because typically in assembly, what do we put, what do we say first? The mnemonic, right? So load, store, add, whatever the, the word is. And then we usually list the destination register first and then the source register second and third. Okay. Um, that doesn't mean that that's exactly how it's going to be in the in the binary. Now, in the Brookshire architecture, it generally, I think, matches up. Everything's in the same order, okay, uh, which is nice, right? I mean, that's one reason why we use that simplified architecture in 101, because it's not complicated, right? I mean, well, guess what? If it's simple, it's not complicated, right? Mind-blowing fact of the day. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So, uh, and then of course, there's a whole, whole bunch of other stuff here, right? Um, and we, we could go at this for hours. A lot of these instructions we've never seen or used what they do yet. Um, but there's also all this like offset stuff, uh, the floating point uh, instructions, uh, which we'll talk about, um, right? I mean, there's just a gajillion instructions on this architecture, many of which are flavors variants of each other, but um, uh, so they're sort of related somehow. Um, right, okay, so the w any any questions kind of there just to to kind of get a sense for what's what on the the opcodes here. Um, so, you know, why would we need this? Well, if we wanted to look at our listing file from last time and kind of see, oh, that's what that instruction really is, right? Then then this table is how we do it. So in fact, why don't we do that? Let's pick uh, pick something from our listing file. Um, so let's do, um, let me go to, I think I put it here, here. Okay, so here was our, um, here was our, um, our listing file from when we ran my sort of little sample program, uh, the, not the, the one that just added two numbers, but the one that did a little bit more than that. Okay, so the one that I wrote, I hand wrote this in assembly. Actually, I used this this question or this code was a uh, uh, something I wrote for the final last year. Okay, so um, anyway, so let's just take, for example, that second instruction, right? The move, the number three, load the number three into the register X zero and decode that and make sure that we're cool why that all makes sense, okay? And so what we had as our instruction was all of that stuff, right? 60008 d 2 
And looking at the, um, the next instruction, okay, what's common about the two instructions there? And what's different? Yeah, the 80D2 looks the same, okay? And the, the other parts look different. I mean, yeah, there's the, the pair of zeros in the middle there, okay? But let's go see, go through and see if we can decode this thing um, based on what we've got in our table. All right, so it was 6,080D2. All right, so let's go. Yeah, and uh, what kind of operation were we loading? It was, uh, or sorry, not loading. It was a move instruction, right? Um, so let's just do Control F here and find move. And this may take a little bit, right? Because this is a pretty big sheet. That's not it. That's not it. That's not it. Okay, I should have gone up to the top to start this because we're down in the... Um, Idiot. Um, and um, the uh, does any of this look familiar? And uh, we can kind of look over here at the at the hex. Uh, this kind of looks like um, this one right here to me. All right, so the variant here, W versus X. Well, what's W versus X on our architecture? What is the W and the X referring to? Come on, Noah or Jack for the clutch. What's uh, what's W or X referring to when we're talking about things involving registers? What are the registers called on this machine? How many are there and what are they called? Well, which register did I use? I used X0 for the instruction that we're considering right this instant, right? Yeah, exactly. So the whole 64-bit width is called X whatever, right? So X0 was register number 0, full 64-bit width. W0 is the 32-bit um, half of it. Right, so the the lower thirty two bits worth of the worth of the data, okay, um, and um, yeah. So because we have the ability to specify whether or not we're doing things with W registers or X registers, even though they're physically the same thing, it's just one is half of the other. The, we have to be able to tell the machine which type we're using, okay, and um, uh, so, you know, compare, for example, um, the, uh, what, what do you notice here? The ones that have an X have a one at the end and the ones that don't have a zero at the end. Okay. Well, that's the perfectly fine way to do it, right? That tells you which one you're dealing with. And then, okay, why do we have move in, move Z, move K, all of those things. Okay, well, for, forget that for right this instant. Um, but then uh, what else do we have? Well, we've got an immediate 16. We've also got the register name. All right, and what, was the, what were the magic numbers that we thought we saw a minute uh, with our instruction? What was it? Six, th or sorry, what was, huh? 6,000 and then... 80D2. All right, now if we look over here, what do we have? D280. Hmm, what's going on there? 
this is an Indianness problem, right? Which order do we write everything in? Okay. Um, yeah, just to keep us on our toes. Um, so the, the 6,000, well, that's going to have to correspond somehow to the register and the immediate, which was the number that we loaded in. Okay. So let me, uh, let me just open up another sheet here and let's kind of go through it. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy paste this thing here. Okay, and then I'm going to just make a new spreadsheet. Okay, and I'm going to paste all that stuff in. All right, then let me adjust the width of all these cells so that it's we can actually see what we're dealing with here. Oops, I need that one too. Okay, so does that all fit? Yes, okay. All right, so what was the immediate value that we were loading for the, the first example? We loaded the number, was it three or one? Three, okay. Well, we did both of them, So, uh, but let's make sure that we've got the, the correct one. Yeah, we started with three, okay. So that immediate value is there, right? one one and then the rest of the immediate would be zero okay then the opcode part well that's the same as what was listed because that was specified for us okay and which register were we putting it in register zero which what's the address for that probably It's register zero. My assumption is that it's going to be all zeros. Okay. Because how else would you count them? Um, okay. So what is, if we write all this stuff in hex, what is this bit at the front, the first four nibbles? Or the first nibble, sorry. So the first four bits. That is... It's an eight and a four and a one makes 13. So two back from F, which is 15 is D. Okay. So there's D. All right. Zero, zero, one, zero is two. Okay. We have a one there. Um, make sure that I'm reading this correctly. Hang on, let me make sure that I actually have the right instruction. Yep, and then we're into the floating point stuff, which is not what we want. Okay. Um, and of course, now I've lost it. go up to the top. Sorry. Uh, Jack, unfortunately, no, that's not how the W's work. So Jack asked, do the two W's combine to make an X? Um, in this architecture, no. W0 is only part of X0, but the other part of X0 doesn't have a special name. Okay. Now that's different in different architectures. So for example, in um, the, uh, let's see, some of the early Intel architectures actually, you could address the front half and the back half separately, or you could combine them into a pair that was double wide. Um, but you can't do that in this architecture. If you wanna talk about the back half, so, what might be the, the higher 32 bits worth of X0, you just have to use X0 and then do what you want to those bits. Um, yeah, that's the, the only way to do it. Uh, okay, so where was I? Um, I wanted to go back to our move instruction. Okay, so there we were there. 
and this is the one I've got. So we've got this one at the end. Um, oh, that's where the eight comes from. Duh. Okay. I'm a moron. Okay. These two things, uh, these two guys are going to be zeros uh, for our purposes uh, right there. The, the ones that aren't specified. Oops. Um, okay. So, um, so if I've got one and then zero, 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 what is that going to be in hex? Right. That's going to be um, zero, zero, zero. So there would be, we'd have an eight there. Then a bunch of zeros, okay, so four over zero there, four more zero there, four more zero there. Okay, and then this uh, nibble, uh, we've got the number three is what we were loading, but in terms of the um, um, the bid positions, that nibble, right, if we're going to put this in hex, what do we have? We have zero, one, one, zero. Huh? That would actually be six in terms of hexadecimal. Okay. And then what's at the very end? Another set of all zeros. Okay. So what do we get when all is said and done? We get D2, eight, zero, 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 six, zero which is exactly what we had in our listing file. Okay, so does that make sense? Yeah? Yes? Uh, yeah, it would be 16 bits, but see, here's sort of the thing. Um, the 16 bits starts here, which is actually in bit position number six. Right, so since hexadecimal right goes in chunks of four, um, what's annoying is that the, like you switch from one field to the other in the middle of a hex character, right? And so that's why it looks a little funny, right? Uh, now, we don't have to worry that, about that in Brookshire, right? So the register numbers and everything being either four or eight bits, everything lines up perfectly in terms of the hex, right? Whereas here it doesn't. And so, you know, D280 and then the six zero at the end, um, you know, might look like we uh, um, are, sorry, uh, might look like we're doing things in, um, uh, like the six, where did that come from, right? But it's really that it's a three, but it's been shifted over one position because the register amount takes five bits, not four. And four bits is corresponds to, four bits exactly corresponds to one hexadecimal digit, right? And But we needed five here, so it's one off. Okay, that's annoying. Um, <clears throat> now, is this the same as what we had in our listing file? Not quite. Okay, what was different about it in the listing file? Okay, so if I go here. Well, first off, the order looks backwards. Okay. And second, what's up with the six zero? Okay, it looks like it's also sort of backwards. Okay. So this is basically an issue of, of Indianness, okay? Meaning, how is this data actually stored in the machine? Okay, and unlike in Brookshire, it looks backwards, okay? So if I were to load in this data into the machine, I have to do it eight bits at a time, right? Okay, corresponding to a memory address. So if I'm going to store this number, um, the number that I wanted to store was, um, where did I put it? Here. Okay, D2800060. Okay, how do I store that in the machine? Well, <clears throat> 
which end am I going to start storing first? Depends on the architecture, right? Whether or not I'm, I'm going to start, store the big end first or the little end first. Okay, so this is the problem of Indianness. Have I have we talked about Indianness before? I don't remember. Okay. Huh? Uh, okay. Yeah. Let's show you. All right. Well, so we have a question, right? Let's go to the bastion of all knowledge of Western civilization. Google slash Wikipedia. Okay. All right. So the word in question here that we're talking about is Indian, starting with an E, not an I. Okay. So not talking about either native people from this country, this, uh, uh, the Americas or people from the Indian subcontinent, right? I'm not, that's not what I mean by Indianness. Um, what I mean is which end are we starting at? Okay. Now the joke, uh, this is actually a giant joke, the, the word Indian. Okay. Um, <clears throat> from it, it's a joke from Gulliver's travels. How many of you guys have actually read Gulliver's travels? No, it's hilarious. Absolutely hilarious. I mean, as much as like 18th century something could be hilarious, but it really is funny. Okay. Um, so the, uh, uh, the, in the story, uh, there are sort of uh, two different um, camps in, um, in this, you know, this world where if they have an egg, and you want to crack an egg. How do you crack an egg? Right, you hit it on the corner of the of the counter or or maybe the corner of the bowl if you're, you know, using that. Okay, but where where do you hit it? Do you hit it on the the wide end that's sort of flat or do you hit it on the the narrow end that's sort of more roundy, right? So the big end or the little end? Yeah, I kind of do it in the middle, right? So, uh, yeah, okay. So maybe it's not uh, the example is not quite as as illuminating as as we would have it be. But it's kind of like if you if you take a piece of toast or bread and you put butter on it, which side do you which which way is the butter facing when you eat? Take a bite out of this bread. Is the butter on the top side or the bottom side? The left side. The left side. <laughs> you eat sideways? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> great. Right. So, yeah, I mean, which side do you eat, eat it with the butter on? Probably everybody the top, right? Because that makes more sense. You put the butter on the top, and then if you were to eat it the other way, that would require reversing the piece of bread before you take a bite, which would be just heresy. For... <laughs> then you're weird. Okay. Um, all right. Well, imagine, right, that the classroom down the hall did exactly like Mr. Hyde did, and they buttered it on the bottom and then ate it buttered side down. Right. We would think that they were complete heretics. Right, and would probably want to go to war with them over their bread buttering heresy. Right? Well, okay, so that's sort of the, the, the story, right, in, in Gulliver's Travels with which end of the egg do you crack, the big end or the little end? Huh? It's okay, Gulliver's Travels is satire, most high. Okay, so like, yeah. Um, all right, so the, uh, so the difference here, right, so don't let anybody tell you that computer people shouldn't be well-read, right, because whoever came up with this word in the first place, uh, or to use this for talking about which end, how we're going to store our data, right, they clearly had read Gulliver's Travels, and I guarantee you that this term is a lot older than the internet and Wikipedia. So it's not like they could just stumble upon this Wikipedia article and say, oh, that's a good idea. I'll just use that. Right? They had to actually know what they were talking about back then. 
That's frightening, isn't it, Porter? Shaking in your boots, yeah. Okay, so anyway, so the, the difference here between a big or little Indian system is where we store, okay, so we've got a number, and if I just write the number out in on paper, the way that we as humans would read it, what do we put at the far right? We put the least significant bits on the far right, okay, meaning the ones that have smaller place values, right? So if I write the number 1832, the two was written last, but it had the least significant, it was in the least significant position, the ones position. The three was in the tens position, the eight in the hundreds, and the one in the thousands, and the, the one in the thousands position was most significant, right? If I lopped off the one and turned 1832 into 832, I just made a way bigger change than if I lopped off the two at the end to say, instead of having 1832, to have 1830, right? So that's what I mean by least and most significant is if you just replace it with a zero, how big of a change have you just made? Okay. Um, so um, when we store this stuff, okay, we have really two things, right? So we've got our number, um, <clears throat> the, uh, the, the number that we decoded, right? The, um, the D2, whatever, whatever, right? And <clears throat> the least significant bit of that, the least significant, say, eight bits of it, because we're going to do everything in eight-bit chunks, has to go into memory somehow. Well, which way are we going to store it? Are we going to store the least significant bits in the lower memory positions, or are we going to store them in the higher memory positions? So you see the difference here on order? Okay. So, uh, well, like, let's say, for example, in Brookshire, right? In Brookshire, how did we do this? If I wanted to store a number in memory cell FF, Okay, what did I put in memory cell FF? I put whatever the number was. Okay, and on Brookshire, we didn't notice anything about Indianness because all of the numbers were exactly eight bits, right? We never had to use more than two, or sorry, more than one memory cell for anything. Yeah? Okay, well, what about if we were to load in more things, right? So let's take our... Uh, what was the number we had when we wrote it down? Um, it was, oops, it would help if I used the correct trackpad, right? D2800060, that's our, our number. Okay, so what's the difference here? Indianness is expressed as big or little Indian. A big Indian system stores the most significant bits at the smallest memory address and the least significant bits at the largest. Okay? A little Indian system does it the other way, where we store the least significant part at the lower memory address. Okay, does that make sense? What do you mean, no? Okay, so let me sort of draw a picture then here, or, or rather I'll do it in, in the spreadsheet, okay? So we have here a 32-bit number, right? All of that stuff, okay? The least significant position is the zero at the far right, and the most significant position, uh, we're moving towards the D that's at the far left, okay? So... When I store this into memory, I have two options. I can take it in the order that it's given and put the number D2 in memory cell zero, the, the number eight zero in memory cell one, the number zero zero in memory cell two, and the number six zero in member, uh, memory cell three. Okay, so take them in the order that they're given, right? So that would be to do this in a big Indian system because the big end goes first into the lower memory address. Does that make sense? 
Okay. What would the little Indian system be? What goes first? The little end goes first. Okay. So let me just type this out. This would be big Indian. Little Indian would do it in the other order. Okay. And this is why the order seems a little flipped. We have to take everything in 8-bit chunks, correct? So rather than thinking of the number as D280 blah, 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 let me think of it this way. Let me think of it as um, D280, 00, zero, zero um, okay, and then of course, uh, let me format this stuff as a, a text so that it doesn't uh, mess me up. Oops. Okay. So I just format it as, as text, even though these really are numbers, uh, because otherwise Excel is going to say zero, zero, and zero are the same thing. So I'll write, it's redundant to say zero, zero. So I'll just do it as text so it doesn't mess with me like that. Okay. So those would be the four 8-bit chunks that we would use to store our data. Good? Okay. Now, Let's come over and let's say that I've got, um, let me actually kind of come over here and let's say mem address, okay, and let's put, let me say that this is cell 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, right, okay. Now, are they really named like that on the machine? Okay. Because how wide are the memory addresses on our machines or on the pies? Yeah, they're 64 bits. Okay. Now, it's actually not all 64 bits. I think we only actually use 56 of them because 64 bits encodes just a gargantuan amount of stuff. We don't actually use all of that, but they're 64 bits. Okay. Even if we don't use all of them, it's 64 bits. Okay. Um, so, um, great. So, so really the memory addresses are going to be zero, 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 right? Zero, 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 one, zero, 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 two, and so on. Okay. But just for shorthand, I'll do this. Okay. So to load this stuff in big Indian would be to put, okay. So let me put big Indian here and let's put little Indian here. Oops. Okay. Big Indian would be to take things to put the most significant bits first. So that would be D2 there, 80 here, 00, zero here, and let me again format these as text just real quick. Um, oops. Um, I want cells, text, okay. Okay, that would be the big Indian approach. And let me blow up the text so you guys can see a little better. I'm sorry. Okay, that's probably a little better. <laughs> No, a commenting on the buttering and egg cracking. It's treason to do it the wrong way, right? Yeah. Okay, so in a big Indian system, that's how it would go in. D2, 80, 0, 0, 6, 0. The most significant bits go into the lower memory address. Okay, and by lower, I mean the numerical address, right? The little Indian system would go the other way. All right, now here's the thing. When you do this, you're taking it in 8-bit chunks, correct? So what is the back half 8-bit, or the back part 8-bit chunks? This thing is 60, right? Not 06. So what do I put 
if I'm going to do this little Indian, what are the least what are the least significant eight bits? It's six zero, not zero six. Okay, what's the next one? Zero zero eight zero D two. Okay, now maybe you would have expected this. Um, maybe you would have expected that zero six zero 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 eight two D, like literally going in reverse order. Okay, why is it not that? How big are the each memory cell? Uh, let me reformat this because I don't think it's clear what I'm saying. Okay, so let me rewrite this. Oh, dang it, it didn't do it. Sorry. Okay. Okay. So this third column, okay, if I wrote the number by copying each hexadecimal character from the right to the left, literally in that order, I would get 0600082D. Okay? And what I'm trying to say is that's not the way that we would do it in Little Indian. We take it in 8-bit chunks in the order that they're presented. Okay, maybe that's a little confusing. I don't know. I mean, it is not even 9 o'clock in the morning. <clears throat> but you take it in in 8-bit chunks. Exactly. Okay, so what Evan just said is you go in 8-bit chunks from right to left, but within each chunk you go from left to right. So for each two numbers. Okay, yes, and that's how this stuff actually gets stored. So what's the little Indian, what would this be, starting with low memory address to high memory address? What would it be? 600080D2. Yes? Okay, well, let's go back to our listing file. How is this stuff, how is data stored on these machines? It's stored in little Indian form, not big Indian. Okay. Uh, I think the processors are actually capable of do, operating in either order. Um, but you'd have to basically tell it which order you want. And, uh, but default, because I didn't tell it anything, was to do things in Little Indian, so we'll just stick with it because it isn't work worth uh, torturing ourselves any more than necessary. Okay, does that kind of make sense? Um, all right, now, not all machines work in Little Indian mode, Okay, so let's go back up to our Wikipedia just to kind of look at um, uh, this, right? So the history, um, <laughs> yeah, there is another another scheme where it's sort of mixed, which doesn't that kind of keep us happy, right? How many of you guys have ever heard of the PDP-11 or PDP-8 for that matter? These are like ancient ancient machines, like uh, Dr. Z has a part of one in his office, and it's like the size of a file cabinet, right? Okay, so this is like a not quite mainframe, but not quite desktop either. It was sort of in the, the period in the middle where you, you know, would have like something that took up the size of this table that was maybe yay tall, Okay, six feet tall or something uh, that's like two meters jack. Uh, and then you might have a terminal next to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> torturing students. Now, the, the, okay, so from your perspective as a high level programmer, you don't care, right? You just type stuff, the compiler and the assembled and the operating system just handle everything for you, you could care less. Okay. Where this matters is with the architecture, like the circuit level stuff. Somebody has to care about this eventually. Okay. And eventually, like this back half of the course, that's kind of one of the things we're going to be talking about is circuit level business. Right. And to start building from circuit level. Okay. So you guys, those of you who are in 101, you remember we were in 101 with me. You remember we had some of the assignments where I put together a couple of logic gates and I said, all right, suppose the inputs are this, what's the output going to be and so on. Okay. And I said, now imagine that you had crap loads of these things put together, then eventually you'd get a full computer. And I just kind of waved my hands in the air at that little step. <laughs> well, <laughs> guess what the second half of the course is? That, right? How do we go from logic gates to a machine? Right, what's sort of the in-between part there? Okay, and when we do it, we will have to have decided which Indianness or what what scheme we want to use, uh, as because that matters which order we connect little wires in on our circuits, right? So it's going to matter eventually, um, and it only matters for us as programmers right now with the. Um, uh, it only matters for us as programmers because we're looking at the assembly level stuff because that's the first point of this course, right? Is to look at the low level programming. Um, okay, good. So let's sort of look at the history here um, of what kind of processors use little Indian versus big Indian. And I wanna say it has a list here, okay? Um, so, um, x86 is little Indian. Uh, so all of your, you know, desktop computers or, or most of your laptops are going to do that. Um, but the ARM architecture can do it either way. Okay, which is kind of interesting. Um, now, for our purposes, because the OS on... Uh, that we've installed has everything in the little Indian order, we'll use little Indian, okay? Um, even though the machine is capable, the, the hardware is capable of doing it the other way too, okay? Uh, now, other uh, machines that did things in little Indian format, my favorite, what's my favorite architecture? Yeah, the 6502, right? So the 6502 was a little Indian processor, and most of them were back in the day. Did somebody say they had a question? Yeah. You said little Indian, they didn't use the combo circuit, they put the wires together, right? Yeah. You know, in terms of the, I'm not actually sure how you would handle big, uh, either Indianness in the hardware. Yeah, you could either put in like a, a flip unit and then just to, if the big Indianist flag was set high, then flip everything when you decode it. That seems a little inefficient to me to do that. So there's probably a better approach. Um, yeah, I'm actually not sure how you would, would, would implement that. Um, I mean, other than just like I said, just having a magic flipper that reverses everything if you're doing it in the other way. Um, but that seems, like I said, somewhat inefficient because if that's all you're going to do, then why bother? Um, yeah. Uh, no, good question. And I'll, I'll maybe dig in to see, see what, uh, why that would be a good, uh, good thing to do. Okay. So anyway, let me go back to my list. I didn't mean to click that, but yeah, the 6502, uh, and, a lot of these other processors, so some of these you've never heard of before, but the 6502 or the Z-Log Z80, um, the Z-Log Z80 was used in a lot of old, uh, like, con oh, not consoles, but um, arcade machines, 
uh, back in the day. So, uh, you know, Pac-Man, I think, originally was written for a Z80. Uh, the Z80 actually is sort of interesting because now how they didn't get sued out of existence in the beginning, I don't know. Um, uh, the Z- Z-Log was founded by some Intel engineers. And the Intel 8086 um, and 8080, right, that sort of early family, uh, a bunch of the people that broke off from Intel to found Z-Log had actually worked for Intel. And so when they designed the Z-80, they were making it Intel compatible with the Intel instruction sets and the pins and all of that so that you could have a circuit board that would be designed for an Intel chip a processor and you could just pop in a Z-Log processor instead and everything would work. Um, yeah. So, like I said, how they didn't get sued out of existence, I don't know. Now, AMD actually started somewhat similarly, right? So, your AMD processors from back in the day, uh, so nowadays if you want to build a desktop, right, you've got to pick a motherboard and you have to pick, do you want Intel or, or uh, AMD from the get-go? Right, and if you buy an Intel motherboard, you can't put an AMD chip in it, and vice versa. Well, back in the day, like even into the mid '90s, right, you would buy a motherboard, and it was an Intel motherboard or Intel chipset, right, and then you would either put an AMD processor in it, or an Intel processor in it, or there was actually a third company called Cyrix, which probably you guys have never heard about is that kind of went the way of the dodo. Um, and uh, the advantage of an AMD processor was you could get similar class performance to an Intel one, but it was cheaper, right? Or you could get better performance for the same amount of money, right? So like, let's say you had your 66 megahertz Pentium. Well, for the same amount of money, you could maybe buy a 100 megahertz AMD chip. And that just, you know, that was a 33% performance increase, roughly, right? Ooh. Us gamers back in the day really cared about these things, okay? Um, Yeah, I know it doesn't sound all that exciting now, but believe me, this used to be a huge deal, okay? Um. Okay, so the, th- these are some of these older architectures. Uh, the a couple of others that you maybe have heard about before, the Motorola 6800 or 68K, the 68000. The 68K, a variant of that, if memory serves correctly, was uh, what was in the, uh, the um, Sega Genesis uh, machine, right, which was a pretty powerful machine at the time, and it blew the socks off of an 8-bit Nintendo, um, you know, compare Super Mario Brothers to Sonic the Hedgehog, right? There's no comparison. Um, I mean, you guys, the original Sonic the Hedgehog, right? Nowadays, you guys have all these variants. Evan was in my office the other day, and he's like, oh, that voice sounds like Sonic's voice. I'm like, what, Sonic has a voice? What are you talking about? Right? Um, yeah. Yeah, well... Somebody ought to do a class on memes. I feel like that'd make up for an awesome rhetoric class or freshman tutorial. Just like memes 101. Huh? I would totally do that as a freshman tutorial. That would be freaking awesome. Right? Your final paper is like 10 pages worth of memes. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, that would be, that would be a lot of fun. So, okay. Anyway, uh, so some of these processor architectures, um, the, um, uh, but maybe a notable example. So power processors or power architecture. Um, so again, you guys are younger, but so you may not remember this, but so let's take Apple computer for a moment, right? So what currently are Apple computers, the computers architecture-wise, what are they using? They're all using Intel, okay? What about their mobile and uh, tablet lines? All using ARM, okay? What did they announce 
this summer. They're going to switch all of the computer end of their segment also over to their ARM architecture, and they're going to custom design all of the silicon to do it, okay, just like they do with your iPhones and iPads. Okay, what's the benefit to Apple by doing so? Their entire product line will be on the same architecture. Okay, everything from your Apple Watch and Apple TV and the stupid little speaker HomePod thing all the way up to your, you know, giant uh, developer machine that costs $10,000. Okay, everything in between will be exactly the same architecture. Now, the marketing kitsch although it's only part marketing kitsch, it'll mean that you can run an iPad or iPhone application on your computer, right? Now, given what many of the iPhone and iPad applications are, who cares? Okay, but, you know, if you've got some really handy dandy like, well, actually, for some stuff, it would be kind of nice. Like, there is no desktop version of Snapchat, right? I don't think. You guys just do it on your phones. Well, those of you who have Macs, like one of the things I like about it is that you can link your phone to it and you can text, you can send text messages from your computer. And I don't know about you guys, but I am way faster at typing with all 10 of these than with my two thumbs. Okay, now maybe you guys are, are faster with just your two thumbs. But I like that, that I can use text messaging and other kind of mobile type things from a full computer environment with the full keyboard and all 10 of my fingers or eight fingers and two thumbs, I guess, but whatever. Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, being able to do Snapchat, that might seem like kind of marketing kitsch, but you know, you could see maybe it being kind of useful, right? It also would make things way easier for developers because then take the Snapchat or the people that make Snapchat, right? Without too much trouble then, they could have a version that's designed for full screen, you know, desktop use, right? Same architecture. So they don't have to completely upend everything uh, to redo it for the desktop experience. All they have to do is redo the user interface because it's going to be a bigger screen, right? That's kind of nice from a developer standpoint. For Apple, it means that um, they're not buying parts from somebody else. Right, Intel is the people designing the architecture. Apple has no control over that, uh, much to Apple's chagrin, because that's one reason they're switching. They're they're kind of tired of Intel lollygagging about. Um, uh, so right now, right, Intel is using a 14 nanometer uh, lithography process, which they have been for like six years now, and they're sort of stuck on it. Whereas AMD and other companies are having way better success with like eight and smaller nanometer. What's the advantage of the smaller lithography process? Or what are the advantages? There's several. Hmm? Huh? Yeah, you can, if it takes up eight nanometers instead of 14 nanometers, then you can significantly increase the amount of stuff you can fit into a given area of a die Okay, what's then therefore the benefit of that? Yeah, better chips meaning better performance. Okay, what else? E uh, Evan, sorry, I almost said Ethan. Oh, uh, okay, listen, I'll come back to that in a second, yeah. A, a little bit. Um, it's more that you can pack more in. Uh, but the other benefit, the real benefit, is power consumption. It doesn't take as much power to run the exact... So if you have 10 billion transistors on a 14 nanometer process and the exact same setup on 8 nanometer or whatever, the 8 nanometer stuff is going to take less energy and you're going to have what, less waste heat. That's obviously a good thing, particularly in your mobile and laptop spaces. Your desktop computer... It's not that big of a deal. You're still going to have a big fan and stuff, and it's not like it's moving around, so it's not the end of the world, but yeah. Okay, Evan, you've had another question. Sorry. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, there's there's two differences, right? Because you've got your processor architecture, but you also have the operating system and all the other stuff on top. It is possible to get malware for phones. Okay, uh, that does exist. It's less common, partly because your iPhone is much more, I don't want to say locked down, but it's a lot harder to do things like that on a, right, uh, right. And then, right, yeah. And fix it, right. Whereas, yeah, so this is more of an operating system level thing than an architecture thing that the, um, the, the mobile operating system is much more restrictive in terms of what the user and developers have access to deliberately, right? Now, the downside is you can't customize things the way that you can on a desktop. The upside is your phone just freaking works, right? Right. So, um, yeah, um, sorry, what else was I going to say? Um, we're almost out of time, but, oh, sorry, the, the reason I brought up Apple is because they didn't used to use Intel processors, okay? Before that, they used, actually, IBM's PowerPC line. Okay. Now, uh, sort of ironically, they switched from PowerPC to Intel, this was in 2005, I think it was, roughly. Well, what what console came out then? What gaming consoles? Well, Xbox, PS3 came out and also Xbox, or sorry, yeah, PS3. Xbox 360 came out, right? So the original Xbox was late 90s, right? Uh, the second generation one came out in like 04, 05, roughly in that same time period. It used IBM PowerPC chips. So uh, Apple switched from PowerPC to Intel because they couldn't get fast Intel um, competitive processors in terms of speeds at power le consumption levels that would fit into a laptop. They had great desktop chips. Right, the the PowerPC uh, G5s were just slaughtered Intel. Okay, but they couldn't get one of those into a laptop, and so they're kind of like, well, crap. We either stagnate our laptop line and wait on AMD or sorry, uh, uh, IBM, or we switch over to Intel. Now it was great that they switched over to Intel for a lot of other reasons, because for example, you can run Windows on your Mac. Right. I find that really handy. I've got Windows, Linux, and the Mac operating system on my my laptop. Of course, I use all three. Um, yeah. Now, and before that, before they switched to the IBM PowerPC line, they were actually using the Motorola stuff. Okay, so the 68K, uh, one of the Macintoshes from, I think, the early to mid-90s used that processor. Um, so, anyway... All right, well, uh, we'll continue with our fun and exciting discussion of architectures and other such details next time. Um, yeah, Noah, there's a good reason to have the other Indian this. Um, I can't really think of anything on the top of my head, but the, yeah, so sorry, I'm just noticing this. All right, I'm going to quit the stream. I will talk to you guys later.